Um, I'm, I'm curious about one thing. Um, how did you get, how did you really get into behavioral economics? How do you start, you know, studying these kinds of things and, <coughs> and strategies for businesses? Yeah. So, you know, my, my, my personal start was uh, very uh, practical. Uh, I, I was in hospital for a long time. I got, I got badly burned and I, uh, and I was having debates with the nurses about how you want to remove bandages. You remo want to remove them quickly, rip them off, or do you want to remove them slowly? And after, I mean, it's a long story, but I, I decided to, uh, when I got out of the hospital, I did experiments on that and I found out the nurses were wrong. So I started from a very practical perspective of saying, here's some problems in my personal life here are things that people are doing to me that I think they're not doing the right thing and I think it's a it's a shame that we're stuck with this lack of understanding of how the world works let me try to prove to people what's a better way to do something and hopefully they'll, they'll change their ways and and this has been the, the the main thing for me going forward now more generally I I think about social science as kind of the most important, hopefully, uh, way to study and improve the world uh, for the next hundred years. And, and the reason is that we know very little and everything we can learn uh, can create tremendous improvement. And you can think about lots of small changes. You can think about how we get people to uh, drive more safely and how we get people to take their pills on time and how we get people not to have unprotected sex. I mean, there's so many things that we need to improve. You look at something like diabetes. We have companies have worked tremendously to creating better injections that are less painful, and still the compliance rate with mealtime insulin is about thirty percent. The problem there is mostly psychology; it's not technology. And, and now we need to uh, turn our attention to the human side of the equation and see how we can improve it. There was there was this very distressing paper by Ralph Keeney that said. How many, what's the percentage of human mortality, of deaths, that are caused by mistakes in decision making? And he said about 100 years ago it was about 10%. Because think about it, 100 years ago, how could people kill themselves? Some accidents, you pushed a rock, you know, you, you did something bad. Uh, a few years ago, the analysis showed it was almost 50%. Why? Because we created lots of ways in which we can kill ourselves. Think about uh, talking on the phone or texting while driving. Think about smoking, obesity, diabetes, right? As we create new technologies, we're increasing the chances that we will do something that will be also very dangerous for ourselves. So for me, uh, social science in general is first of all taking a step back and saying, how are we behaving? And which ones of those behaviors are based on real data and real information and which one are based just on intuition. And let's check whether the ones that are based on intuitions are things that we should continue doing or maybe stop doing. And we might have a good feeling about it, but is this more than a feeling? Do we have some evidence for this? And social science is all about taking our beliefs about how we should work in the world and trying to um, test them. And sometimes we find that what we believe is actually true and sometimes we might find that it's not true. And when it's not true, that means we should take this opportunity and do something different. Um, one big concern for um, every business that is starting to consider the idea of basing their changes on research, on psychological research or social psychology research, is the validity, the external validity of the research. Because yep. they say, you know, you, you're doing research in a lab with some, some psychology students. That doesn't mean that it's going to work for us. And, and that's, that's one of the main problems that you face when you actually start talking to someone about, about this kind of change. They, they say they, didn't, they don't believe it's actually going to work. Do you think yep. there's, there's any kind of uh, aspect of, I don't know, any element that is characteristic to business companies? Um, that can change um, how things work? So, so I think this is a, a, a good and complex question. So, you know, we start our experiments, we do them on uh, students, and then we find some pattern of behavior. And when we come to uh, implement it, you can ask multiple questions. 
Uh, first of all, you could say, uh, before, before I saw the results of this experiment, would I have predicted these results of this experiment? Right? And if you didn't predict it in that situation, you should ask yourself, are my intuitions good? It's true it's college students, it's true it's an experiment, but if you, your intuitions were that it would work differently, then I think you should say to yourself, let me take that as evidence that my intuition might not be right. And then my intuition might not also be right in the other case when I'm doing it. Right? So that I think is the first case. So we did an experiment on bonuses in India and you could say to yourself, this is just about India. Right? Right. But before you saw the results and you know, after our research center here is called the Center for Advanced Hindsight. Because in hindsight, people can explain to themselves all kinds of things. But then you can say, before you saw the results, would you predict that these results would happen there? Now, if you have a model in your mind that says, undergrads behave this way, but other people behave that way, up front, not after the fact that you can justify something, then I would say, okay, then, then we, should, we should think about it more carefully. But most people, their intuition is that the undergrads will be just like other people, and then you should start doubting your intuition. That's... That's the first answer. The second answer is that I don't expect people to take a result of an experiment and buy it 100%. Right? E- economics is all about updating basic beliefs. You have a belief about the world. You think the world is going a certain way. I just presented to you a new type of evidence. You could do one of two things. You could choose to completely ignore it or you could choose to take it into account and update your beliefs. Now, completely ignoring it, I think, is just wrong. It is a new type of evidence. You could ask yourself, how much do you want to update your beliefs? Do you want to take it very seriously, a little seriously, but you can't discount it 100%. That, I think, is kind of rationally wrong. And then finally, I think this is also puts a burden on us. So we as researchers... Uh, need to take these ideas and need to uh, help get companies to help us test them in real life. I think it's, it's good. So I think what we find in the lab is probably generally correct and probably has some important insights in it. But will it work just the same way with other people? Or is this the ideal way? Or will it work differently with men and women or people who have a long history with the company or not a long history with the company? There are things we don't know. And we should take it as a kind of an idea of a basic rule, but then say, from now on, we're going to, this is the starting point, and we're going to continue testing it. So, do you believe that uh, doing research, not literally, but, you know, doing some kind of research inside the company would be good? I think there's no way that it wouldn't be good. Um, You know, there's no way that collecting data will mislead you, right? I mean, the truth is that we have beliefs and we have data, and the data is the truth, and beliefs are hopefully the truth, but not necessarily the truth. So the more you base your decision on real data rather than intuition, I think the better off you would be. Now, sometimes data is hard to come by. Sometimes it's expensive. Sometimes it might not be worth it. Uh, but, But the... There are so many cases in which you could get some kind of learning in cheap. You know, if you think about our approach to experiments, we're really doing stuff on the cheap, right? Uh, yeah. Whatever we're spending is, is a fraction of what companies are spending on anything. One ad in the Wall Street Journal funds the whole, you know, a, a big research project for a year probably. <clears throat> but you should, you should make this trade-off between small experiments with less conclusive data but very cheap, and big experiments with more conclusive data, but more expensive. And I believe in kind of starting small and refining our thinking and getting a better handle of what we know and then moving to the more expensive stuff over time. Yeah, I think I think that's a good idea, actually. Also because uh, I don't know how much of the behavioral economics research is transcultural. I, I really don't know. Do you, how, so so you not... Know? Not much. I mean, there's a couple of really nice papers that have gone to small-scale societies uh, like hunter-gatherer and played the ultimatum games and the trust games and 
uh, some other some other experiments um, but most of the things are not really uh, transcultural but the the thing is that we find in general uh, that culture explains very little of the variants so uh, I think we need to get more into it but so far culture doesn't seem to be a doesn't look like a main explanatory variable. Which brings us to talk a little about neuroeconomics, which is a brand new hope for companies, as you said in your paper. So tell us a little about neuromarketing and how it works and why do you <coughs> think it really is the, an important part of the future of businesses? Yes. So. So the idea is that uh, economics, new classical economics, is all about what people do. Uh, and there's another step for it, is what people think and what they want to do. And that doesn't always translate to what they do for all kinds of reasons. Um, so it seems like it's important to figure out what people want and not just what they, what they do. Um, so, and, and also because sometimes it's really hard to measure what people actually do. If you're creating a new product or you're doing something that doesn't exist, you can't see what people actually are paying for it. You would want to know what they're thinking. So getting kind of a handle on what people think, what's happening in the brain, seems to be a useful, a useful direction. At the same time, I think it's a little, uh, this field, while being very important and could be incredibly important, uh, is being overhyped right now. Mm. And I'll give you an example. There was in the in the 1950s. There was lots of studies on priming, on the idea you can show something, flash something for a, a fraction of a second, and then it would change behavior. And companies look at this and they say, "Hey, wonderful! Let's take it into the movie theater and let's start flashing really tiny amount of coke or burgers or something." And then people would go and buy those things. Well, it turns out it didn't work, <laughs> and companies stopped doing it. Now, psychologists have kept on working on priming for the last 60 years. And it turns out it's a really interesting phenomenon. It's very robust and it can get people to behave in all kinds of ways, but it's not the simple story in which you flash something on the screen and then people go and buy Coke. So it was overhyped. Companies tried it, they failed, they remember the failure. And now when the science is ready, very few companies are actually doing something. And I'm afraid that the story with neuromarketing is going to be the same, that uh, people are overhyping it, uh, mostly people who are, have companies that try to sell neuromarketing. Um, and I think, I think it's a really important direction, but we're at a junction that in which if companies use that right now, there's a risk that they will fail because the science is not ready and they will not try it again in 10, 20, 30 years when the science is really ready. So. Um, I think it's potentially useful, not yet for commercial reasons, uh, and, and because that worries me. Um, so you think it's just uh, too young as a, as a technique to use right now? That's right. It's, it's complex, it's difficult. Uh, there, there might be some things that you could use it for, but, but not in a general way yet. Uh, and also, it's very expensive right now. So I think what, what companies should do is they should keep an eye on it. They should think about it. But the idea that a company goes in and take 12 people and they watch some cars and they use their design of cars on that looks to me a bit premature. Very premature. 